So, hey, how you doing, everybody? I'm here with my buddy Matthew, Matthew Dons. We're in Yokohama, and um, down by the water here, there's the ship over there, the city is behind us. I used to work over there in, um, Oh, I forget the name of the building now. What the hell's that? You know, tall building over there. Is that landmark? Yeah, yeah. Actually, like a landmark tower. Wow. And so I was here for three, four years. So Matthew, I haven't seen you in nice. f four or five years. How's it been going? Uh, what's going on? What's new? I'm still alive, which is the main thing. So Matthew has been fighting cancer forever, <laughs> forever. It, feels like, it does feel like forever because. You know, the time before cancer is like compressed now in my memory. So, yeah, it's just like there's a kind of like foggy blank and then there's cancer. <laughs> and that started seven and a half years ago now. Yeah, so we used to, you know, when I lived up in Tokyo, we used to meet for like, we would meet in cafe, we would have these conversations uh, about, you know, career and learning and uh, innovative like memory tactics, you know, things like that. We talk about health and money and just really everything. And so I miss those conversations. So uh, that's why I wanted to have a conversation with you here today because we're going to head up to Tokyo for the Tokyo Linux user group. And, uh, so maybe we can like have like a monthly uh, podcast or something like that to continue those conversations. So, all right. So it's been, I, actually, I saw you in Osaka um, about five years ago, I think it was now. Yeah. So give us an update on your, on your status, on your health status. So, <laughs> the short version. <laughs> so I'm still alive after, yeah, being diagnosed with terminal cancer seven and a half years ago. And at that time, the prognosis was, was realistically about seven to nine months. That's based on the data that was available then, which comes from like the previous five years. But now, if we look at the data from then and five years on, it seems that realistic prognosis would be about 15 months at that time. So people who got the same level and amount of cancer as I did in summer of 2016 they were generally living about 15 months and I've somehow got to seven and a half years I'm laughing because it's it's like terminal cancer seven and a half years ago six months to live so, and so, so when is it no longer terminal at this point I mean seriously when do they classify you as well or cured so Generally, when you've had like three to five years of, of what's called NED, no evidence of disease. But of course, yeah, if it like reappears on the scans or whatever, then you're, you know, that gets reset. Um, but I mean, people don't really know, right? We don't really know because if you can manage the cancer as a chronic disease and it doesn't really affect you, are you cured i mean obviously lots of people are walking around with cancer not knowing it you know the vast majority of people who have cancer would probably die of other causes anyway and we don't you know we obviously can't count those people um and before scanning and autop you know modern autopsies and stuff of course many many people died of cancer and you wouldn't right. have any idea right um so yeah, I'm, I'm right on the edge of like the known data. <laughs> um, so, okay, so all these years in and out of hospitals, surgeries, all kinds of treatments and stuff, um, you did, I mean, you went to obviously mainstream Japanese cancer therapy, but you also did a lot of sort of innovative things. Just a quick summary of those. Yeah, and, and you know, going back to our, our, our meetings, and of course, originally, you know, you and I did the Tokyo Bar Camp. We did a couple of Tokyo Bar Camps, in fact. And it's really crazy because it feels like that was almost like tra training for this. Oh, yeah. Because of course, when you know when I was diagnosed with suddenly diagnosed with cancer, you fall back on what you know. So it was like the connections I'd built up, the knowledge I'd built up, the kind of skills of where do you get the knowledge from, right? How do you judge if something is worth pursuing or not? I mean, that's what you have to deal with all the time with cancer, right? Yeah. So I, you know, I was doing the the mainstream Japanese treatment. The, I mean, the three pillars of cancer treatment used to be surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. Um, those three are not particularly nice. <laughs> I mean, surgery involves cutting you up, 
<laughs> radiation involves irradiating you, and and you know chemo is is the use of poisons to try and kill cancer. And you know chemo, in fact, evolved from chemical weapons, right? It was, it was, um, I think it was like an accident at the end of World War One. A ship carrying chemical weapons, like mustard gas, um, it like crashed or something, and then soldiers, um, like the soldiers on the ship, it turned out some of them had. Um, kind of the the lesions and wounds like shrank a bit and the surgeons were like oh this is kind of interesting so then there was this realization that that family the must the so-called mustards could be used to treat um in that in those cases uh, i think it was the early blood cancers so this is like really toxic stuff so in parallel to, so first of all I, I try and minimize all that right so i try and choose chemos which don't impact the immune system too much which is tough when you're using really toxic chemicals um i try and choose you know minimal surgery when you can um and in parallel to that i've done a lot of particularly immunotherapy so immunotherapy is this whole new emerging branch of well i shouldn't say new for doctors it's new <laughs> for immunotherapists you know it's one of those that, like this american guy in the early 80s was um uh, dr rosenberg like the father of, immuno of immunotherapy you know he he was he was doing it and like ridiculed by the medical profession and um yeah all these immunotherapists were were sort of doing these experiments with or kind of medical case studies with maybe human cells um maybe from the patient or maybe from other like commercial cell lines and getting kind of remarkable results in a very very small number of cases it's very easy to dis dismiss that as well it's a it's an outlier we shouldn't base medical policy on outliers um over the past sort of now almost 40 years the thinking is kind of reversing on that and the outliers are the things we really want to study right and many things have helped me be alive for seven and a half years but a really big one was about a week after i got diagnosed i was in, I was in in england and i met my friend eben upton he's very famous for uh co-design of raspberry pi really really smart guy really 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 sm off the scale smart and i was having lunch with him and his wife liz and again liz is like possibly the cleverest person i've ever met and eben told me about the like the the wave like you can surf this wave of getting the newer treatments that give you a bit longer to live and then hopefully there's more treatments coming along he was saying that you know in, in 2016 there were still some surviving people with hiv from the original waves of hiv right now of course you have a lot of patients and some of them get these new treatments and a few of those get a good response and a, a few of those are then able to get another tr maybe a trial a few years later but basically you have this kind of population sadly diminishing population but that is sort of surfing along this wave of the new treatments and i thought that's that's what i want to do <laughs> right i want to i want to be there right so based particularly on that conversation and a lot of self-study um you know ironically one of the things that really saved my life was BitTorrent because with BitTorrent you know I can get the the kind of video training that is like for medical students and doctors and surgeons and things so doing a lot of self-study with you know I mean a medical textbook is like 60 to 150 dollars fortunately we can get them via BitTorrent as well so based on that study I've kind of identified four way or four kind of traits that help you have long-term survival right so one of them is access to the newest possible treatments one is get the treatments that cause minimal damage to the immune system because one thing that's become clear from the medical research medical literature is that all long-term survival is about the immune system it's not about being able to remove all the cancer because i mean it's sub-microscopic right a, a surgeon doing surgery can get 
maybe tumors down to like three millimeters, two millimeters or something. Um, but, you know, a little cluster of cancer cells, you know, can be a nice healthy tumor a few, <laughs> a few months later, right? Um, so, yeah, long-term survival comes from the immune system, get access to the newest treatments, have as much treatment as you can manage, and that's tough, <laughs> it's really tough. <laughs> But then the other big thing is have multiple treatments at the same time. So typically with cancer, you have a treatment and then it's stopped because it's either damaging you too much or it's not getting a response. And then you go on to another one and then you go on to another one. And this is largely for economics, right? And maybe that makes sense when you're thinking about economic policy. I mean, you've got all these people, they're sick. If you pay for one treatment, there's maybe not money for other treatment. There's many things other than cancer in the world. There's many diseases. I mean, sadly in 2023, like, you know, biggest killer of children in the world, I think is still dirty water, right? Dirty water, biggest killer of kids. You know, there are many, many things. So for health policy, maybe this is a good approach. But for a cancer patient wanting to live, it makes much more sense to choose several less damaging treatments, have them at the same time. Because what you're trying to do really is stop the cancer evolving, right? Because when you have a bunch of cells and you try and kill them, a few of them survive by chance, right? A few of them had different, slightly different genetics or the cell membranes were slightly thicker or you know they were in a slightly more oxygen rich or oxygen deprived environment survival of the fittest it's basic evolution really basic evolution right we're putting survival pressure on by like treating it with various treatments there's um a lot of reproduction because cancer reproduces so of course you're going to get evolution there's a lot of mutation right because you often have a high rate of mutation within cancer tumors so it really makes sense for, from a patient's point of view several treatments at once well then that says i mean the treatments have to be stuff you can tolerate well that typically means you need to get the newer treatments a lot of these chemotherapy drugs for example are old i mean a lot of them are like 1970s 1980s um and they are very, very, very toxic. I know, you know, we have to be, I mean, everything is toxic in large amounts, and some of these we do take in very large amounts. But when I say toxic, I mean, like I took a drug called oxaloplatin, which is one of these platinum-based toxins. You know, it attacks your peripheral nervous system, so like the long nerves in your arms and legs. It attacks... Um, in theory, it can't get into your brain because of the blood-brain barrier, but definitely attacks nerves in your face. So I remember this thing, it's called first bite syndrome, like you start eating some food, and as you bite into it, you get these like lightning shocks over your face. You get, um, it causes like mouth sores and inflammation of, of the mu mucosal mu mucoid membranes in your mouth. So, you know, eating is very difficult. You get um, hand foot syndrome where there's kind of this redness and numbness on your hands and feet. So that when you're walking, it's like you're walking on wet, mushy sand which is nice if it's a romantic beach and you're in Hawaii. It's not nice if that's day in and day out. So, so these things are very, very, very toxic. Um, so yeah, those are my like <laughs> my four pillars of long-term cancer survival, right? New treatment, as much treatment as you can manage, multiple treatments at once, and do everything you can to protect your immune system. And one of the things I noticed not only now, just as you were describing it, but also just you know knowing you throughout the whole process. Um, pretty shortly after you were diagnosed, I moved from from Tokyo to Osaka, so I wasn't around very much. And then there was the pandemic. Um, but you did so much research on your, you know, what you know, all by yourself. And you, like you mentioned a little bit earlier when we you know did those bar camps and stuff we were just kind of figured out how to build a community and you know how to put those conferences together you use the same sort of self-researching skills to research this so i guess my point is anybody can do this anybody with the will anybody with the desire and half a brain can 
figure things out, at least to a certain level, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think it helps if you have an interest in science and tech, yeah. I think, because increasingly it's getting more and more and more technical. Um, but really, it's uh, do you, I mean, do you know how to learn? Unfortunately, education systems, quite bizarrely, I mean, I, I you know, I was in education and I was never, I, I don't recall a single lesson on like how to learn. That, that's that exactly the weird the, though? Like, wouldn't you think, like, yeah. it would make sense to say, okay, Monday morning is learning how to learn and we're going to do this you know every week for the next 10 years while you're in full-time education or whatever Monday morning let's work out how to learn that would make sense <laughs> so yeah you mentioned um this concept of 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 how to learn right so I'm doing this presentation um, basically, it's a career presentation where I, I use the photography. I've taken many, many pictures, thousands of pictures of developers like you um, over the years and a lot of the things that they've taught me about their career. And one of the things that's always struck me about software engineers, really, really anybody who is innovative into tech or science, they self-learn. They teach themselves how to learn. And it turns out there's a long literature of, of learning and it's not necessarily taught in, in various school systems, but it goes back a hundred years. It goes back a hundred years in the psychological literature and the neuroscience literature. There's a book called Make It Stick, and a lot of it's documented there. It's, the freaking book is this thick, you know? Um, and it has so many really practical examples. And so you did that. And this is what we used to discuss in our little sure. coffees. Yeah. yeah, and I think that, you know, People in the medical profession are very busy. They have some ongoing training, but you know, when you're dealing with a, your cancer doctor, your oncologist, I mean, they're dealing with like hundreds of patients and they might be dealing with quite a few different types of cancer. So we have to become a, kind of become an expert on our situation. And that that's not a, um, that's not a smooth thing. <laughs> Because then there's there's inevitable conflict, right? When you've picked up something, you you go to your oncologist and say, hey, you know, I saw this study, or you know, there's this doctor in the U.S. doing this, and oncologists, you know, the, as any human would, might feel a bit threatened by that. They don't want you to have false hope. They understand that the situation is often very complex and, so, and particularly sometimes the mainstream media will you know report some medical discovery as if it's like a drug or a treatment when it's really years and years away and when something's years and years away in medicine that essentially means it's not going to happen because the vast majority of things don't turn into treatments um, I was listening to a, a podcast recently on, on anti-aging and this guy was talking about the effects of these various treatments and, and this was this was um, um, preclinical so this is like mouse studies right and saying like these various treatments and it, I mean this is a, a doctor saying about these various treatments extending the model of the, the lifespan of the mice right However, towards the end of the interview, he kind of, he didn't exactly let it slip, but he just happened to mention, of course, the mice didn't actually live any longer because they get destroyed anyway. What they're doing is measuring markers that correlate to a longer lifespan. So it's like, you got these mice, treat them with these drugs, based on these various biomarkers, it looks like their natural lifespan would be double, for example. Really impressive, but it's like, they didn't get some mice and get them to live twice as long. So even just understanding that kind of thing, when understanding about what does it mean when you know you have a mouse model that a drug is tested on? What does it mean when it's done in a test tube using human cells, but from a commercial um, cell line? What, how is that different from using human cells from actual tumor tissue? Like the, some of the universities, university hospitals have like these big libraries of tumor tissue. So when we kind of are trying to learn about medicine, you have to get down to that kind of detail. 
um, because a lot of it is like we're learning because we need to understand this stuff but ultimately we need to make decisions and that's very 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 tough right how do you make decisions where you have incomplete data or conflicting data or information of various qualities and you're trying to like mash this together in your brain and making a decision because decision making is another one of the you, you think quite a fundamental skill of humans but I, I don't remember much about being taught about decision making I mean <laughs> wasn't wasn't something you did at school no you just pick it up right you just pick it up <laughs> or, you, or you don't as, as you know as I think many of us have found right it's something that you don't pick up or, or or you have a lot of wrong information in your head right we have a lot of wrong models the problem is that when you have a, a wrong model you know what is it Mark Twain said um, it's not what you don't know that hurts you it's what you know that just ain't so right so, so like you've got this information coming in but if you've got this very peculiar model about how the human body works or how reality works or whatever it kind of gets twisted out of shape right so um you know you might have well i mean can cancer is a very weird thing because with cancer until it's very late stage the cancer generally doesn't harm you much the treatment harms you massively so so psychologically that's that's really weird right and again think about that conflict of you go and see the doctor and the doctor is someone who doesn't make you feel better but makes you feel worse right so every time you know you might do a chemo treatment where it's every few weeks and you're seeing the oncologist you know every three weeks or whatever and then every time they're giving you a drug that makes you feel really bad and they're not sure if it works they're sure it damages the body they're not sure if it you know it seems to work for some people we're not really sure why you know current best practice is you know do this drug <laughs> so it's a, it's a very strange dynamic right it's not like you know you've got a bad chest infection you go to the doctor they say okay here's three antibiotics um low dose of each one you'll probably get a response in like a couple of weeks if not come back right you take the medicine you start to feel better over a few days and you know you're good right <laughs> this is very different <laughs> it's like you go to the doctor they say okay you're just about well enough to take the treatment today enjoy your day of drips and then your two weeks of pills and then your week off see you in three weeks time it's a very very odd <laughs> dynamic a very odd relationship very strange conversations <laughs> so you and i met years ago up in tokyo um when i was at sun working up in solaris project and you were uh, i met you through the actually I met you on twitter you actually pinged me on twitter and that's how we met and um you know we did the bar camps we did went to a lot of communities up in Tokyo, a lot of tech communities. Um, have you kept up with the various communities in Tokyo in the last few years? You mentioned Raspberry Pi. I noticed you've done a lot with them over the years. I mean, what's your opinion on the communities in Tokyo in terms of the tech community? So, yeah, there's there's still stuff happening, of course, with, you know, with COVID, we had like two years where there was basically not a lot of in-person stuff. And that's you know, that's been good and bad. I mean, you know, doing a lot of stuff online has been very good for some people. I mean, people who are, just can't travel distances or whatever, that's good. Um, there's, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're always living in interesting times, but tech at the moment is, it's particularly interesting tech communities however are particularly kind of conflicted at the moment i think that you know obviously there's cancel culture there's issues about inclusion you know there's issues about i mean we've a lot of technology at the moment that could go either way right i mean you know ai is of course like this big um phantom hanging over us all the time right um so there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on i think i always feel a bit frustrated that we're still not super good at 
building and maintaining healthy communities. Like, uh, I think that still a lot of stuff has to be done manually and we have to do it. Like we can, we can never assume, you know, we can never assume that things are going to be self-sustaining. So I'm like, you know, I'm a big believer in like, you actually need to go into the different communities and connect people up. That, you know, a lot of communi human communities in general are very inward looking, yeah. right? And that's, that's sad because all the richness is in the connections, right? All the cool things like, connecting up different communities or different communities going out into the real world and seeing what cool stuff they can do um i mean uh, you know i'm my main interest i guess is education and i always think wouldn't it be nice it I, I think a lot of tech communities are very welcoming to people in education but that's still very far away from going and meeting the people where they are i mean physically meeting the people where they are like you know if you have a say a community around a, a certain type of operating system or certain software it's just wonderful if you can go out and talk to some educators at schools or universities and say look we have this thing it's free we will help support it we think it will be of benefit to university students or kids or educators themselves or whatever so so yeah my thing is always like how can we be more outward focused um how can we actually go and you know not not just welcome people from lots of communities lots of backgrounds but actually go and get them right yeah. go and you know make it really easy for them because if we don't do this then everything gets very kind of locked up it gets you know very commercial <laughs> um that's what I've noticed, is the commercial. I mean, I went to a couple of open source conferences in 2017, and it was just, you know, all suits there. Yeah, and of course, I mean... So where did the hackers go? Exactly, and I mean, of course, the cliche at the moment is, is with OpenAI, which started off as <laughs> quite non-commercial and, uh, yeah, went through, went through quite a 180-degree change, right? Um, so I think... Yeah, it's always important to be outward looking. I think, I mean, yeah, you know, Japan has lots of interesting little communities. Um, you know, I, I take my son Edward to like Maker Fair, which we still have in, in Tokyo. Are we meeting live? Yeah, um, uh, in Odaiba, Tokyo Big Site, you know. And it's, it's kind of shrunk, shrunk, shrunk. But also, I, I get the feeling that all the different groups there, that's the time they see each other. You know, it's like twice a year, right? They're not they're not going out of their way to you know meet up with each other. And of course, now I'm very interested in the medical world as well. And I'm thinking, like, what are the cool ideas from the tech world and tech community that I can introduce into the medical world? So a big thing I want to do is some kind of bar camp style event for nurses and doctors, right? Get um, particularly for the nurses actually. The nurses have an incredible knowledge that the doctors don't have, right? Cause I, I totally second that. Because the nurses just spend so much time with patients, yeah. right? And that often the nurses are very, very good at communication and very, very, very good at teaching because frequently it's down to the nurses to teach the patients. I mean, particularly in cancer, we, we have to do a lot of what's called self-care. You know, we have to we have to manage the symptoms of of the the side effects of the medicine in order to be able to take the medicine over longer periods of time. So as the nurses, they have to sit there. You know, when you're in the chemo ward, they're sitting there explaining like the five different skin um, creams that you have to do each day to you know to try and stop all this uh, infection uh, caused by the the chemo suppressing your immune system or killing off the. We've got like a uh, by a what's it called like a fauna right so like you know on your skin you've got all this living stuff and it's a whole universe on your skin universe and it, and it keeps us healthy I mean it without it we're dead yeah unfortunately chemo tends to wipe a lot of that out right it uh, the the bio, biota I think it's called right not yeah um, the same in our intestines right yeah. so now we are basically bacteria we, we are I mean I always think you know hum, humans live only for one reason right and that's to pass on dna 
the big mistake is thinking it's about passing on our DNA. It's not at all, right? We are we are an environment for bacteria, right? And then it's kind of beautiful and poetic if you think about it, right? Um, so yeah, nurses have that amazing um, depth of knowledge and those interpersonal skills. And I just think, wouldn't it be so smart for newly qualified doctors to spend a lot of time learning from nurses, right? If I could do events where they could talk in a very kind of free, unstructured way. But then also, how about nurses from different hospitals talking to each other about, you know, that what are the little hacks that they've come up with to help themselves or to help patients? You know, what, you know, what are those daily tasks maybe they've um, modified some of their equipment or some of their clothing or whatever to be more practical in a hospital environment. Maybe they have kind of big daily frustrations that are just not getting up to the management level or or the pharmaceutical suppliers, right? Um, you know, bad design of medical equipment or whatever. So nurses have this this incredible knowledge that. I mean, I I can categorically say it's being underused in the medical system because I've had seven and a half years of spending a lot of time in hospital, a lot of time talking to nurses. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I spent half my 20s in and out of hospitals, but, you know, for something else. And the nurses, even back in the U.S., I mean, here they're on another level. I think Japanese healthcare system is vastly superior to the United States. Um, yeah, but the nurses in the United States, even back then, they were incredible compared to the doctors in the hospitals. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of that is just they spend so much time with the patients, right? I mean, you know, you might, if, if you, you have surgery and spend a couple of weeks in the hospital, I mean, the nurses are with you all the time, right? Day in, day out, they're with patients. They're talking to people of different ages, different backgrounds. Um, you know, it's easier for them to maybe connect with many patients. <laughs> I guess you could say nurses are more normal than doctors, yeah. right? Um, and obviously with, with chronic health conditions or very serious health conditions, there are, there's always a lot of context for the patient about financial issues, about family issues, all this kind of stuff. And my my sense is that nurses are a lot better at understanding that kind of stuff. You know, if if you're hesitating about a certain treatment that would require you being off work for weeks, doctors find that very hard to understand because it's like, look, this is a, you know, this surgery has been shown to be massively beneficial in 85% of patients and you know you get a very good recovery and you're hesitating because I mean you need to look after your kids you need to be in you know some of us like freelance workers if we don't work we don't get paid or um, nurses kind of understand that a lot better than doctors do right um, it's just basic life yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, my friend, we're, this is a beautiful day. I feel like staying at the harbor here and kind of walking around, but we have to go up to Tokyo. And uh, But these are the kind of conversations we used to have in the coffee shops, you know? Yeah. So we used to talk about disease and we used to talk about learning, particularly learning, you know? Um, and we would spend hours drinking coffee and, and talking about these things. And now we're separated by you know Osaka and Tokyo so let's let's keep talking every couple of months let's get together and see what's new and um, and uh, it's great to see you looking so good well, seven and a half years good good on the outside not necessarily good on the inside that's a whole other story <laughs> all right we'll talk to you soon be good guys cheers excellent, excellent. that's good cool